Our next speaker is uh, Michael Heron. Um, he's the principal for Pivot Engineers and he's the chair of ACI 117. Um, and his presentation is here. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, officer. And so, so chair of 117, who's currently main meeting, is in progress. And so I'm going to uh, take off from here as soon as I get done with this. And I just want to acknowledge that Bruce is the, uh, the vice chair of that committee. So I want to start off with a confession that essentially I am not a perfect person. Despite what Bruce may tell you, he is not a perfect person. Design is not perfect, construction is not perfect. And so there are problems. At least the expectation is that we'll get the moat on the right side of the wall, but essentially, but once it's over there, there's still some stuff to talk about. And so unfortunately for our industry, um, Bruce has been talking about it. And so Bruce has been doing a lot of work uh, within um, tolerances and doing a lot of work, you know, since the ACI in general. And so Bruce has actually been involved in ACI longer than I've been alive. He's been involved with uh, 117 uh, longer than I'm practicing engineering and has basically done a lot of good work. 30 plus committees with leadership positions, ACI awards, um, numerous papers, including one that we're proud of uh, for him at 117 in terms of the Concrete International Award for the establishing thickness tolerance as parking slabs, um, as well as numerous position statements, you know, within ASCC. And he is the co-author of Tolerances for Cast-in-Place Concrete Buildings, which is one of two books that you can find on Amazon um, on construction tolerances. So, so talking about imperfection, this is nothing new. You know, since the first uh, you know, kind of instance of this within the American Concrete Institute literature um, comes from John Nichols in uh, the 1940s. I think it's pretty succinct. It talks about, uh, as a matter of fact, no building is ever plumb, level, straight, true, or dimension. That is not exactly, fortunately, need not be. And so what we're going for here is that, you know, we're not, we're not trying to be perfect. And so, like I mentioned earlier, we're not perfect people, we're not perfect design, we're not perfect contractors, but we don't have to be. And so really what we're looking for is basically the standard of care. And so what are we doing relative to our peers um, as designers? And as contractors, basically using reasonable skill, building things in a workmanlike manner, stuff like that. So again, we're not striving for uh, perfection as relative to your peers and you know, essentially reasonableness. And the code acknowledges this as well. And so ACI 318 has some section where it talks about those strength reduction factors, where we're basically knocking down the amount of usable strength that we can take advantage of in our designs. And so one of the reasons for that is this imperfection. And so basically that we have variations in material strengths and we also have variations in material dimensions. So again, we're not perfect. And so the question, you know, kind of gets begged if we're not perfect, you know, essentially how imperfect can we be? And so that's where tolerances uh, come in. And so according to ACI, tolerances are the permitted deviation from specified dimension, location, or quantity. And the most common reference for this is a specification from Committee 117, specification for tolerances, concrete construction, and materials. And so one thing that's important to point out with this document that it's a great document. There's a lot of good information. We're in the process right now of updating it. We're in the process right now of trying to improve it and clarify it. But at the end of the day, it can't be the end-all, be-all for every different structure. Obviously, there's a lot of things that you can do with concrete. And so these tolerances may be applicable. They may not be applicable. But right there in section one, it talks about that it's for a you know kind of typical structure. So I'm not I'm not sure what that is. I think Bruce told me at one point it's like a four-story office building in Omaha or something like that. You know, but it's it's for typical structures. And so we've got and, and basically the expectation is that if you have something that is not typical, um, that you need to specify something different, or if you have something that's not covered by 117. And 117 is also not fully inclusive. And so if there's you know, tolerances that you need, for example, the clear height, you know, since between the top of the slab and the bottom slab is important, there's not a tolerance for that. You may want to basically provide that. So something to keep in mind as you're utilizing the, uh, the document. So there's a lot of different tolerances within the document. And so there's not just one tolerance for a potentially particular element. And so here's just an example on an elevated slab. And so just a little you know, section of slab here, uh, and we've got six different tolerances. Uh, that we have to keep in mind. And so that have to be kind of treated independent and concurrent. And so we've got tolerances on reinforcement position. We've got tolerances on reinforcement cover. We've got to take into account the, what's the elevation of the bottom of the slab, the top of the slab, as well as the thickness. And so there's a lot of things that we need to be looking at, you know, essentially, as we think about tolerances that uh, we have to keep in mind. And we don't get you know, a lot of partial credit on this. You know, you know, we're not shooting for an 80%. So, so these tolerances are independent and concurrent. Like I said, we got to meet all the tolerances that we um, are applicable. And so the other question that comes up a lot is, 
you know, our tolerance is cumulative. And so we've seen questions come in, say, I've got three quarters of an inch here, I've got three quarters of an inch here, and three quarters of an inch here. Can I combine those to get a tolerance of two and a quarter inches? And the answer is no, unfortunately not. And so uh, and that's in, you know, in uh, section uh, one of uh, the specification. And then we've also got this notion that tolerances are statistical, they're normally distributed. And so the expectation is that if we take some measurements that you know, the vast majority are gonna be centered around uh, the specified value, and then as you get further and further away from the specified value, that you, the likelihood you know, starts to decrease until hopefully that all or nearly all of the measurements are within um, the tolerance ranges that are specified. And so just talk about you know, essentially how this gets applied. And so we'll just a quick example of concrete tolerances on a uh, slab. We're gonna stay away from the reinforcement tolerances for the, uh, the sake of time. And so we've got tolerances on thickness. And so we've got you know, minus quarter inch on uh, the thickness and we actually have no limit. There's no plus tolerance on the thickness. And so does that mean we can build it as thick as we want? You know, maybe. And so we do have other tolerances. So we've got elevation tolerances on the soffit. And so we can be plus or minus three quarters of an inch. And the important point of the thing out here, pointed out is that this is before the removal of shores. So we shouldn't be evaluating um, tolerances on elevation uh, in a deflected shape. And similarly, we've got top surface tolerance uh, of plus or minus three quarters of an inch. And so just to highlight the uh, fact that you can't combine these, you know, essentially you can't say, okay, well, I, I built my slab an inch and three quarters too thin. I'm still within tolerance, right? And again, the answer is no. And so we've got uh, tolerances that we have to meet concurrently and we're violating our thickness tolerance in this case. And then if we look at the plus side, and so you say, I've got no limit on thickness tolerance, I can basically keep going, right? And so the answer is obviously no. You know, we've got uh, thickness tolerance, excuse me, elevation tolerances, which was really bound um, this slab thickness. And so the way that we should uh, think about tolerance is not, you know, in terms of like an absolute value, but really is like envelopes, you know, essentially within which to work. And so we've got range of acceptances. And just a couple example of deviations from specified, example one on the left. And so we could have something, maybe it's a little bit high, you know, it's a little bit thin, but still, you know, essentially within that range, so we're good kind of extreme example on the right, and again, let's discount the uh, position of the reinforcement, but if we just say focus on the concrete, we say it's three quarters of an inch high, three quarters of an inch low, we got an inch and a half thickness, at least with respect to the concrete you know, section, you know, since that's still uh, within tolerance, but it's unlikely. And so the reason that's unlikely is that, like I said, tolerances are expected to be statistical and we're supposed to be you know, around the specified value for the most part. And so if you have something that as you get away from the specified value becomes less and less likely, and in this particular case, you've got two things that are happening at the extremes. And so you've got basically a thickness tolerance, excuse me, an elevation tolerance on the bottom that's you know, at its maximum. You've got a top surface elevation that's at its maximum. So two things that are very unlikely. And then you've got the third thing that makes it even more unlikely is that these are happening in opposite directions that are compounding. And so therefore we're, you know, we're not dealing a lot with you know, essentially slabs that are you know, an inch and a half thick, you know, essentially for um, this particular reason. So we've got our specified tolerances, and now we've got to go out and measure them. And so and basically that creates its own uh, challenges as well. And so in terms of uh, another document from 117, and so just to plug is the, we've got the guide for tolerance compatibility and concrete construction, also a great document that Bruce had a big part in. Um, there's some guidance in here that we borrowed from PCI that says, as we're going out and measuring these tolerances, we should be doing it with something that's got the accuracy of one third of that tolerance or less. And so what we want to do is if three eighths of an inch tolerance, we want something that can measure to an eighth of an inch or better. And similarly, three quarters of an inch, quarter inch are better. And we talked about earlier, tolerances aren't cumulative, but even within measuring these tolerances, there's some factors that can kind of stack up uh, within that. And it's good to be aware of that as we're going through tolerance evaluation. And so again, coming from the compatibility document that it's important to recognize that as we're installing components, those components and those products basically have their own tolerances. Um, and then as we look at just basically the concrete section uh, and the accuracy of that, as we talked about earlier, the slab, for example, you know, even that has basically got a couple different components in it. And so we've got the accuracy of construction, which is really what we're trying to measure. But that said, that we've also got the accuracy of what we're measuring with, that those things kind of can get compounded. And if we think about that, going back to our statistical um, kind of breakdown of what tolerances are, you know, essentially that's baked in. And so this is something 
We've got on the right, we've got the construction range where we're trying to measure. We've got variability and, you know, basically measurements that um, also get baked in. So if we have a bunch of people go and, you know, using the same device, even we've get, you know, essentially some variability and all that kind of gets uh, factored into the tolerance itself. And so a lot of people um, think that tolerance is just very simple and, and very straightforward. And so what's the big deal? You go out there with a ruler and Lufkin, you know, folding ruler and you go measure it. And so, you know, it's not a problem. And so it gets a little bit more complicated than that when you start pulling on the threads, um, you know, as I've, as I've learned as an engineer. And it gets even more complicated if you start looking at things, you know, essentially with non-destructive testing. And I talked about this uh, last uh, in Orlando. So as basically your results are now, you know, essentially not with tape measure, but with NDT and basically calibration and stuff like that, where your accuracy essentially is certainly affected relative to what's, what uh, you could get with other devices. And so going back to taking that concept of, you know, the accuracy of what you're measuring with, kind of taking that into account in terms of the accuracy of what we're using to measure it, you need to take that into account. And so, as mentioned, we've got kind of the components of the measurement range, the construction range, and tolerance range. And so if we want to keep that tolerance range and basically say, okay, I'm going to keep that three quarters of an inch that we talked about previously, um, but that said, I'm going to, what I'm using to measure that now is less accurate, you know, essentially than what I uh, should be using in the guidance. And so that basically says my accuracy is going to decrease, my range is going to increase, and if I'm going to keep what the construct tolerance range on the left, that means that the construction range has to decrease in order to kind of take into account um, that increase from the measurements. So in that case, the accuracy of the construction would need to increase, the range would decrease, which is really not practical, you know, especially as we're looking at, especially if we're looking at stuff after the fact, uh, using non-destructive testing. So the other condition is probably more likely. And so what we have, if we're going to be using stuff that's less accurate or taken into account, it's not that the construction range or the construction accuracy is going to improve. We need to really think about that on the evaluation side in terms of the tolerance range that you know, we're considering and how we're looking at our tolerances. And so this is you know, complicated enough, but that said, once you add another you know, kind of dimension to this, it becomes a little bit more complicated. That was a, you know, kind of a snapshot in time as you go out and measure something. But what happens if you go back and you measure it the next day, you know, a week later, a month later, a year later? You know, essentially, how does that go into the tolerance um, evaluation? Because as we all know, structures move. And so in terms of how and when we measure that uh, matters. So at 117, we've captured that in some uh, locations or some conditions. Um, to the highlight here, um, basically look at slab flatness and slab levelness. Uh, those we measure within 72 hours after finishing to avoid some of the time dependent effects, um, such as shrinkage and possibly of curling. Uh, we've got measuring elevations, as mentioned previously before, the removal of shores to you know, avoid kind of the deflection component on that. So as we're evaluating contractors' work, it should really be in a shored um, condition before you get. You know, these are extreme examples, but before the deflections become part of it and it's no longer all about the contractor's work and their ability to meet that elevation, we have the deflection uh, which becomes part of that evaluation. That said, there are other factors that are very real in terms of, you know, kind of creating movement within structures that really aren't captured right now within 117, you know, something that we're working towards and hope to uh, be inclusive of that. But, you know, so examples here are post-tensioning, you know, essentially as we're applying, you know, 27,000 pounds, you know, per strand to the side of a slab edge, you know, that has a tendency to shorten axially. So should we be measuring that tolerance, you know, before uh, that's good stress? Should we be measuring it after? You know, essentially it's something that we don't have fully captured. So, and then similarly in terms of shrinkage, you know, the, as the concrete shrinks, it'll change, reduce in volume, and depending on your restraint conditions, yeah, you know, that may pull that slab in edges as well in as well. And then thermal, same thing, place it during the summer and then come back and 60 degree temperature change, you know, that may move, cause movement as well. Is, is that fair to kind of go back and measure that after the fact, you know, when it's uh, not on the contractor? Another example is retained soil um, and a cantilever retaining wall. And so something that gets placed plumb, uh, basically active backfill against it. And so now that is gets pushed over. And so, you know, when is the right time to, to measure that? And so these are all questions that um, we hope to have, you know, more include that I think people understand well, but is not really part of the tolerance discussion uh, yet a tolerance document. But it's not to say that it's not published. And so back to Bruce. And so Bruce uh, has done some 
really good documents on this. And so just some examples here, uh, some articles from Concrete International, um, as well as uh, the tolerance book that I mentioned available from ASCC. So Bruce has done a lot for, for tolerances. I'll hit on a few uh, from my opinion. Uh, he has really raised industry awareness of tolerances you know, through those publications, through ASCC, uh, has really kind of brought these things to light and kind of made people more aware of the potential issues that kind of extend beyond you know, what we have within the, the document. And so he's also our tolerance historian, you know, essentially on the committee. And so those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Or uh, he basically tries to keep us out of the ditch. You know, we may start going down a road of like, well, no, we tried that, you know, it didn't really go very well. So that's been appreciated as well. And as an engineer, I really appreciate and admire the fact that he takes a scientific approach to kind of a seemingly simple topic, you know, always data driven, um, put out a lot of good information, um, you know, on non-destructive testing and LIDAR scanning, essentially most recently. Um, always a very um, objective and, you know, essentially fair approach to, uh, to evaluation um, as well. He's been a resource for the industry committee and me others, especially me. So thank you for that, Bruce, as well as getting things done within the committee, you know, committee force multiplier and then never worry about things that uh, Bruce is, uh, is working on. And I know that others in the committee uh, feel the same way. And so just that some aren't able to share that with you today, Bruce, but um, Will wanted me to pass along that, you know, basically you've been guided into ACI. I you know, really appreciate your mentorship and kind of uh, sharing your knowledge. And while you're not gone yet, he will miss you, you know, essentially when you're gone. And so, and then also David Bazzelli, um, two things about this that I think are great. One, uh, basically saying you always fight for what's right, you know, essentially, and that's been great. And I've witnessed that, you know, within the, uh, the committee. But the other thing I think is funny is that you've been fighting with Alan Face on minimum local since 2007, um, <laughs> apparently. And so, and that continues to this day. And then David Shook. And so we don't have a lot of engineers on the committee, um, but David is one of them. And David uh, really appreciates your ability to stand your ground as a contractor, but you know, have make space for different opinions and bring other voices that otherwise might be heard. So I think it's a, a good comment from someone who's you know, kind of on the other side of the fence than the uh, designer. And so, and then uh, Frank Solzano uh, really wanted to highlight your essentially outside the box thinking. And so, and basically problem solving. And, and so he mentioned several, uh, he talked about chairing a committee in a robe as well as any, uh, and, uh, bringing a pina colada. So, I asked him if this was Puerto Rico, he said no, so I'll have to get the story on that sometime. Sorry I didn't see that firsthand. He also shared several other stories that I can't share <laughs> in this uh, meeting. And so, but anyway, um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, if not, I will run back to the, the 117 meeting. <laughs>